I invite you to open a Bible to Matthew chapter 25 as we look at this parable of the talents that Jesus teaches us about the heart of our God. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive the words of Jesus, we begin in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would comfort them, encourage them, and point us to Christ through his word. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that the Holy Spirit would, through God's word this morning, uplift them and encourage them and point them to the hope that is found in Jesus Christ and his salvation. And finally, I ask that you pray for me that I would preach faithfully and truthfully the word of God and boldly proclaim the salvation of Jesus Christ for sinners. Psalm 19 says, may the words of mouth and meditation, my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So what is your God like? When you think about God, when you think about Jesus and his attributes, what is he like? What words, what images come to your mind and to your heart? Because ultimately, that's what this parable is about. Even though talents are a form of money, and yes, Jesus uses the language of money, ultimately what he's talking about is the kingdom of God, how the kingdom of God works, and ultimately our relationship with our God. And so what is your God like? That is the question of this parable. And so Jesus tells this story to teach us that our God is ultimately a generous God. And so even though there's three servants listed, a servant that gets five talents, a servant that gets two talents, a servant that gets one talent, a doctor gives in his commentary on Matthew points out that really this parable is about two types of people and two types of understanding of who God is. The first two servants view God as being an incredibly generous, faithful, loving God. And so their response to him is to use the gifts that he gives them, the money and the possessions that he gives them to bless others and to grow God's kingdom. And then the third servant, though, views God as this harsh, hard man who is not generous but is limited in his resources. And therefore, he goes off and he doesn't do anything with what God gives to him. So ultimately, this parable teaches us about who our God is. And so as we look at this story, I want to show you three things that teaches us about God's heart. And the first is that God gives with a generous Heart. And so in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 says, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. One talent is about 6,000 days worth of wages. So when you think about how much God is, as the master in this parable, is giving to each servant, This is an incredibly generous amount. And it's nothing that they've earned. It's not theirs. It doesn't belong to them. He says, I'm giving to you out of my property, is what the text says. So God gives from what is his to his servants with the expectation that you and I, as the servants in this story, will be good stewards. But the first thing that we have to understand in order to be good stewards is that our God gives with a generous heart. This thing about 6,000 days. How many of you want to start counting down 6,000 days? It's about 20 years. So this is a lot of possessions. This is a lot of talents. This is a lot of money that God, the master, is giving to his servants out of his own property, out of his own possessions. This is how generous he is. In Psalm chapter 50, verse 12, God says this, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the whole world is mine and all that is in it. I love this psalm because I think it's kind of God being a little sarcastic. And I love being sarcastic, so it makes me feel good. That if God can be sarcastic a little bit, so can I. But I love that he looks at his people and goes, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. What is God doing? He's reversing it, right? We're the ones that are to go to him when we are in need, correct? 
When we are hungry, when we are in physical need in this earth, as his children, we're supposed to go to him and say, we need you to bless us and to take care of us and provide for us. And God reverses that and says, see, that's the point. I don't go to you when I need something. When God gets hungry, if he does get hungry, he probably doesn't, he's saying, I don't go to you because I already own the whole world. And everything in it, he says, belongs to me. Just like in the parable when Jesus says, the servants get all this stuff, five talents, two talents, one talent, all of this possession, all of this money, and yet it came from where, according to Jesus? From the property of the master. It came from the master, what he owned already, and he was simply generous with it. And so God is saying, look, here's how generous I am to you. Everything in the world belongs to me, but I trust it into your hands. I'm generous towards you, and I provide for you, and I meet your needs. And in James chapter 1, God, the apostle James says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all. This is who our God is, that when we are in need, when we need guidance in life, whatever it might be, whether it is possessions, whether it is wisdom, he says, I am a generous God who gives to my children who are in need. And so the first thing that Jesus wants us to understand about who our God is is he's a God who gives from a generous heart. Now, see, if you understand that, and you understand who God is, you will live totally differently. You will view your money and your possessions and your time and your skills and abilities completely differently because you will view them as gifts from God intended to be used for his glory and the love of others. But if you're like the third servant and we don't understand that God is generous and loving and kind that everything already belongs to him anyway and we're just stewards, then you will behave like the third servant and you will be selfish and stingy with what God has given to you. So the first thing is that God gives with a generous heart. The second is that God gives with a trusting heart. God trusts you with what he's given to you. He trusts you with the gifts that he has given to you. And so it says in the parable, in verse 15, to the one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability. So God looks at the servants, the master looks at the servants and gives them different types of gifts, different um, sets of gifts according to their ability, meaning he trusts them to be able to use the gifts wisely, which is why I shared the James passage where if you ever wonder, how does God want me to live? How does he want me to use the gifts he has given to me so generously? We should ask him for wisdom and guidance, and God's word says he will give to us generously, right? And so Jesus gives to each servant according to their own abilities. So what does that mean? Well, it's the way we talk about spiritual gifts. Anybody ever done a spiritual gift inventory and figured out everything you ever need to know about yourself, right? right? But they can be helpful, right? We figure out, okay, how does... How has God wired me? How has he created me? How has he formed me? And how has he gifted me? Here's the thing that I always point out for people and for y'all, and I've done it before, and I'm gonna keep doing it again and again and again until we all get it. We call them spiritual gifts or gifts of the spirit because that's what the Bible calls them. But the key phrase there is, of the Holy Spirit. They're gifts of the Holy Spirit, meaning God the Holy Spirit looked at you created you and said, this is how I am gifting you. This is how I am forming you and shaping you. Here's the abilities and the treasure and the time that I am giving you so that you can go out and love people and bring glory to the name of Jesus. So here's what I always tell people. Don't return the gift. All right, Christmas is coming up. Don't forget to buy gift receipts in case they don't like your presents. It can be awkward, but it might happen. Right? There's no gift receipt with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He didn't mess up. 
He didn't make a mistake when he shaped you and formed you and made you the way you are for his glory and for the loving of other people. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 4 says this way, as each has received a gift, so you've got one, you've got at least one, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's, and I love this phrase, varied grace. It's all about God's grace. He's the master with the property who gives generously out of his grace and love to his servants. And Peter says, it's out of his very grace that you and I are gifted, that we are given various abilities. And this is why Paul talks about how we're all part of the same body and we all need each other. Because your gifts and my gifts are meant to complement each other so that we can work together as a church to share the love of Jesus with as many people as possible. So Peter says, it is a gift that you have received of God's varied grace to each his own ability, as Jesus says in the parable. In Romans chapter 12, the apostle Paul says it this way, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And I love that phrase, having gifts that differ. So it's a good thing, not a bad thing, when we have different spiritual gifts and different abilities that God has given to us. Because according to Jesus in this parable, he's saying, I'm giving you gifts based on your own abilities to use them for my glory and for the loving of others. So Romans chapter 12, verse 6, again, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. So one servant got five talents, another servant got two talents, another servant got one talent. But the expectation of the gift was the same for all three servants, which is what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, which is you would use them. That we wouldn't waste what God has given to us, whether it it is money, whether it is possessions, whether it is spiritual gifts. That is according to God's word and Paul In Romans chapter 12, we would actually use the gifts he has given to us according to his grace. So here's an example. Yesterday we had a quilting event. It was awesome. I went to it, and they taught me how to make a quilt. I figured it out. Now, I figured out two steps because that's all they thought I could handle, which is what the parable says, right? To each according to his own ability. That's all I got. I had two steps. And then I messed up the one step, and so everybody just joked that next year when we're blessing all the quilts, we'll know which one Pastor Mark helped with, because it's a little off, but it's still there. It's still warm and good, all right? Now, here's the point. We all have varied gifts. They're all different gifts. We all have different time. We all have different possessions. We all have different abilities, and yet Jesus is telling us in this parable, I've given them to you out of my own generosity so that you can use them for my glory, to each his own ability. And Paul says, we all have different gifts according to God's grace in our lives. And then he says, so let's use them for the blessing of others and for the loving of others so that more and more people will come to know Jesus. So the first lesson from Jesus is that God gives with a generous heart. The second is that God gives with a trusting heart. And the third is that God gives with a missionary heart. There is a purpose to the gifts that he gives to these servants. In verse 16, we read, he who had received the five talents went at once and traded them with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. And so the two servants who will be told by Jesus, good and faithful servant, both of these guys get told that, even though one received five and the other received two, there's no contest. There's no bickering between them. They both just take what God has given them and uses it for his glory. And in response to this, Jesus looks at both of them and says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. There was a purpose to these gifts that the master gives to the servants. And the purpose wasn't to be selfish with it. And the purpose wasn't to be scared with it. The purpose was to be generous with it, to grow it so more people would be part of God's kingdom. And that's how you hear the words, good and faithful servant. Whatever God has given to you, however he has gifted you with his varied grace, 
We go, oh, this is what my God is like. He has given me these gifts, these possessions, and this time in order to love other people and to bring glory to his name by growing his kingdom. And so the first two servants do this, and then Jesus tells each of them, enter into the joy of your master, which is a beautiful phrase. This is the joy of the master is we get to celebrate that the kingdom of God has grown. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells multiple parables about lost things being found. And in response to the lost things being found, Jesus says, there is more rejoicing in heaven amongst the angels than on all the earth when one sinner repents. So what is the joy of the Lord? It is sinners learning about the grace and the love of Jesus and turning to him and believing in him. It is the kingdom of God growing. And we get to enter into that joy when we serve him with all the gifts that he has given to us and all the abilities that he's given to us. Whatever they are, whatever number they are, five, two, one, doesn't matter. He's saying, oh, I've gifted you for this purpose. So God gives with a missionary heart that we would use that gift to be a blessing to others and to bring glory to God. So we want to see more and more sinners saved. And so the question is, what is our God like and how do we know our God is like that? So here's what to write down if you're not writing anything else down. John 3, 16. You wanna know what our God is like. How do I know he really is generous? How do I know he wants to grow his kingdom? How do I know he wants to see sinners saved? John 3, 16 says it this way. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. But that's the point. How do I know what my God is like? How do I know what Jesus is like? How do I know he's really a generous God who loves sinners like me and has gifted me? And the answer is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And as Christians, we take that generosity of God, that gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, and we go, this is what we want to share with our whole lives. This is what we want to be about as a church, with all of our possessions, with all of our time, with all of our abilities and gifts of the Spirit, to see more people know the love of Jesus for sinners, so that more sinners may be saved and the kingdom of God may grow. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are a generous God who loves us with a perfect love. We thank you for the love of John 3, 16, that you gave to us the ultimate gift and the ultimate sacrifice to your death on the cross and your resurrection from the grave, to give to us the ultimate gift of eternal life. May we use the very grace and gift that you have given to us to bless others and bring glory to your name so that more and more sinners may enter into your kingdom. In your name we pray, amen.